All right. Well, um, it's, a, it's an, an incredible pleasure to be here. This has been, I think, one of the most inspiring and productive conferences I've ever attended. So thank you all for that. I'm leaving here with a wealth of new ideas uh, and uh, an exposure to all kinds of ways of thinking through digital humanities that I uh, wouldn't have dreamed of before. So um, all the appreciation in the world to the organizers and to all the presenters and everything. So. It's just, it's just great to be here uh, at the end. Uh, so what I'm going to do today is uh, go through probably a lot of stuff really fast. Um, I would like to talk a little bit about uh, the background of the project, which is going to be review for some people in the audience here, uh, and then move into um, what we did during the collaboratory here in the Amundsen Lab over uh, the last year in terms of thinking through some critical UI, uh, user interface and user experience design choices uh, in this very complex uh, political uh, landscape, essentially, uh, and, and trying to represent what is a complex political landscape in VR. So uh, first of all, if you haven't, has anyone been to the Bears Ears? Is there, has anyone gotten out there? If you haven't gone, you gotta go. It's like one of the most special places on earth, uh, I think, um, and it's, uh, it's a very, um, there's just a, an excellent uh, sense of, of of just being out there, it's just wonderful. So um, it's, a, it's a, one of the richest and uh, uh, most dense archeological landscapes in the United States. There's over 100,000 archeological sites out there from basically every conceivable time period. Uh, and it's also a sacred space for, for many, many indigenous communities out there. Interestingly, um, there's many languages out there, all of the, uh, Every single language in the region refers to this the same way, as bear's ears, right? So uh, this is kind of a universally recognized sacred space uh, that we're kind of tasked with representing here. So a little bit about the, uh, how this project started. I am a Mayanist, um, so not really uh, uh, that acquainted with this uh, region until about 2016, in which I was uh, taking, uh, I was using photogrammetry quite a lot at that time. And I met uh, uh, Dr. Bellarado at, the, at a conference, and he was showing this wonderful place. And, and I said, you know, maybe, maybe, just maybe I can take this uh, crazy photogrammetry stuff and start applying it uh, to this. It, it, to my knowledge, at that time, it hadn't really been done before. And I thought this was an excellent technical challenge. Uh, and so uh, what I ended up with it by, the, uh, by the end of that summer was uh, an incredible array of, of sites and even of landscapes. And, and I thought, what am I going to do with all this stuff? And so the natural answer seemed to be VR visualization. Uh, and so uh, very early on, I, I began experimenting with VR using this incredible data set. Uh, and then, surprisingly, uh, not much after that, uh, Bears Ears was declared a national monument by the Obama administration. It was a time uh, of incredible celebration for Ben and I, and of course, many, many others, uh, communities out there, especially uh, it's an excellent move to protect this uh, delicate resource. Uh, and then uh, pretty soon after this happened, right, the Trump administration comes in and in their effort to undo all things Obama, they slash the monument down to a, a small percentage of its previous size, uh, and uh, which was, you know, really endangered the place. And we were very, very concerned about that. And it's right about here uh, where the Canyon Country Cultural Landscapes Project was really uh, you know, began in earnest, uh, and we, we really saw ourselves as kind of enmeshed in this larger political conversation. I will say, just to ease some, so, oh yeah, and, and we weren't alone in that, right? Uh, the uh, Bears Ears Intertribal Coalition is a, like an absolutely historic coming together of indigenous communities throughout the area, uh, and they are, uh, to this day, incredible advocates for the protection of Bears Ears. Uh, through both the legal system, but also community organizing, uh, really making uh, noise on a national and international level to bring attention to their fight to protect and preserve the bear's ear. So we were, you know, kind of trying to see how we might, uh, you know, bolster that effort in some way. To ease some of the, the tension in the story here, I will say that uh, now, uh, if, you, if you haven't heard, but in October 2021, uh, Deb Holland, who probably not uh, coincidental here, is the first indigenous cabinet level secretary in the history of the United States, restored the Bears Ears to its uh, Obama uh, boundaries, its original boundaries. 
Uh, nevertheless, it's still a threatened landscape, right? We still have visitation to worry about. Uh, there are still uh, political movements uh, in, in Utah and elsewhere to, to uh, you know, use this place as a, 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 an area of resource for extraction and, and otherwise. So the fight continues to go on. And our small piece of this fight is this uh, Canyon Country Cultural Landscapes VR project. And the idea here is uh, we really wanted to create something that was uh, first and foremost public facing uh, and that would provide uh, an, an arena, a, a space for uh, the layering of multiple narratives all centered on the bear's ears. So primarily in our, in our, in our minds was indigenous communities and their narratives of, of what this place meant, uh, means to them. Uh, and, and not just the sites, but also the kind of regional landscape and everything. But also because we're working in such a flexible medium, uh, we envisioned ourselves as being able to integrate multiple narratives, including land managers, conservationists, and of course, archeologists. Uh, and the concept here and the, the kind of why, you know, the answer to the question of why VR is um, to maximize the kind of emotional connection that we would need in order to raise the right kind of awareness. Because not all awareness, particularly of sensitive archeological sites, is good, right? We don't really want to be driving visitation to very sensitive places through their exposure uh, and then having them uh, potentially be visited uh, in a disrespectful way or uh, you know, encourage looting or anything like that. So we were thinking about, okay, how can we take all of these narratives and then build it into a package that's going to teach people about not, uh, not only how important it is to folks, but how to interact with archeological sites in a sustainable uh, way, a responsible and respectful way. Uh, and then in the, we are also kind of a, we have a, a fairly large roadmap here and uh, a number of years down the road, we're, we're hoping to kind of switch into phase two here, uh, which is sort of less about our uh, sort of public facing model and more about uh, creating modules that meet the needs of our uh, tribal partner communities and their learning objectives. So uh, one of the things that uh, we hear uh, sometimes in these conversations with these communities is they're having trouble engaging youth in things like language learning sometimes or uh, just transmitting that generational knowledge uh, you know, down the line. And, and technology, you know, the, there's plenty of Oculus Quests out there, right? Uh, so. Uh, uh, the kids are, are into this stuff uh, to a point, so it's a, an opportunity to maybe leverage technology to meet some of their needs as well. Uh, and ultimately, I see a, the, the, our role uh, shifting over time, that we might um, begin to empower communities to become content creators of, of, of these kinds of experiences uh, you know, generated from within the community, right? Uh, and, and get them to you know, potentially build upon our platform to to tell their own stories without necessarily me being involved. Uh, but this is gonna take some really creative work in terms of finding ways to uh, deconstruct the digital divide in a way that's sustainable. Uh, we can provide a laptop and a, and a VR headset and a camera and so forth, all the, the basics that you need, but how are we going to support that uh, you know, five years, 10 years down the line? That's what it takes, right? So uh, we're, we're still working on, on solving the, those bigger challenges here. In terms of the experience itself that you'll see, we also had to overcome a lot of technical challenges, which is kind of what we spent the summer of 2016 doing. Uh, and this is uh, just working with very, very complex environments that are not necessarily particularly friendly to photogrammetry, right? So you get lots of super bright uh, to very, very dark environments, some in which uh, with, your, with your eyes you can barely, barely see. So we did a lot of work just trying to figure out how to photograph these spaces in ways that would play nicely with photogrammetry, ultimately moving to a lot of long exposure, sometimes 20, uh, 20 plus seconds of the shutter being open to capture these extremely dark spaces uh, and render them in a way that uh, uh, you know, would make sense to the user. The other thing that we had to do is create, uh, um, to, to embed these sites into a landscape. In the bear's ears, Yes, the sites are important, but really uh, the way that they're conceived of by the people who live there and, and me as a social landscape archaeologist by training is it's not just the site, right? You have to, to understand the site, you have to uh, understand where it is in space. Where can it be seen from? What can you see from it, right? So uh, we had to, to kind of think about how are we going to capture these really, really large spaces, in this case, uh, 
just about over a mile of this uh, canyon system here without the use of drones because they're forbidden in that area. So all y'all who are using drones, I'm uh, super jealous uh, because I had to do it uh, one, one camera position at a time across this, uh, this whole canyon system. Uh, so that was that. And then of course creating new workflows, I won't linger on that. Uh, and the product was uh, more or less this, and this is, you'll get a chance to kind of walk, uh, walk through this, and this is our, just a really bad <laughs> animation of, uh, of the base model for Moonhouse. I'll take this second to just say that Moonhouse was chosen because this is a site that is very, very well known, which uh, directs traffic potentially to this site as opposed to others. There's a permit uh, required to go here, so it's already uh, under, uh, under the watchful eye of the Bureau of Land Management. Uh, and there's a ranger that typically rolls through uh, at kind of random times throughout the day. I've seen them up there uh, every time I've been out. So there's, it's, a, it's a protected site in that way. It's also an extremely sacred site for the folks uh, who live there now, for the, for the communities. Uh, so much so that, that, that some uh, won't even enter into the spaces where, where we were photographing, which uh, we'll, we'll kind of talk, I think, a little bit about that later on. So you'll see here that uh, not only did I capture the interior spaces, I'm also keenly invested in creating a, a fully uh, polyagonal model of the, uh, of the entire view shed, which is McCloyd Canyon in this case, uh, such that you can even see the site from all the way uh, across the canyon and traverse that landscape and get kind of multiple views uh, and perspectives of the site. So uh, you'll hopefully enjoy that in a second here. So now I want to shift our attention to uh, the kinds of questions that we had to ask in the collaboratory here. Uh, how are we going to uh, essentially create a user interface and a user experience uh, that can meet uh, some very, very specific needs? And uh, here are the kind of main ones. I mean, there's, there's others, but I think we need to uh, think about how we're going to guide the user through the experience in an accessible way. Our target audience for this is visitors to the bear's ears. Uh, and so uh, that's a lot of different people with a lot of different uh, exposures to technology and so forth. Uh, so we need to remain accessible as possible. Uh, and our, uh, our, our content library uh, ideally will be quite large and diverse and experience non-linearly. So how do we solve challenges in terms of telling the story, expressing everything we need to express uh, uh, with this, you know, uh, with a, without kind of being able to uh, go to point A to point B to point C, et cetera. Uh, and then, of course, remain uh, embodied within the landscape. Uh, and then most importantly, I think, are these, these really last, last two here, uh, which is uh, think through how we can, you know, uh, deal with or, or understand the concerns of this kind of product uh, to our potential partner communities, uh, which is, you know, kind of takes a, a lot of thinking through cultural logics. Uh, and then ultimately, how do we remain sensitive? How do we recognize that we are dealing with sacred spaces? And ultimately, it kind of, oh yeah, it kind of comes down to, uh, kind, kind of comes down to this question, which is, can we uh, dealing with this uh, manner of cultural heritage material, can we uh, rely on the kind of common VR game vernacular uh, that, that uh, is so uh, honestly effective uh, in, in solving most of those kinds of problems, right? So the kinds of things like, you know, some of our early ideas here that we sort of soundly rejected are things like collection through the site or uh, glowing things, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't mean to call anyone out, but floating question marks. You know, these kinds of things that are extremely effective and, and very valuable uh, in, in many ways um, makes your job a lot easier. This might not be appropriate to have those kinds of things glowing and floating and certainly not collecting, right? Uh, that's the, the exact wrong ethic, right? So, uh, so we, uh, you know, began thinking through starting really at the very, very basics. What will things look like? What colors will we even draw upon? What font choices are appropriate, right? Uh, you know, there's really basic questions that I had not at all thought about. Um, how are people going to move through the, the what will be a, a kind of com complex, multi-level uh, experience? Uh, and, you know, uh, guide users to content and show them uh, 
not only audio or expose them to not only audio content but also potentially visual or, or you know, film these kinds of 2D things. Um, how are they going to move through that and without necessarily placing, say, screen-like uh, constructions in the middle of a sacred site, right? Uh, so for that, we decided on this, uh, I think, a really great innovation, this sort of wrist menu that's tied to one's body as opposed to, uh, you know, out there in the world. Uh, and I think that uh, you'll hopefully get a chance to, uh, to take a look at that. So it's something that is both intuitive and also minimizes disruption and I, and I think remains relatively uh, respectful of the landscape. The other thing that we have to do is accommodate a lot of content, a lot of voices uh, that are uh, involved in this, and also deal with some very, very complex intertribal uh, and government-to-government -government politics, right? It's quite possible that not all of our users are going to want to hear from the BLM or from a neighboring community, right? So we need to think of ways to uh, allow users to kind of control what content they'd be exposed to. Uh, and so we're, we're um, kind of you know, working through those issues as well. Uh, and then uh, the exhibit space was, uh, I think, really, really important to us too. Um, just to back up, I guess, a little bit here is uh, not only are we looking at, at sites, we're also uh, building in a, a place to show artifacts uh, you know, ancient, ancient stuff that might be in museum collections today, uh, but also the work of contemporary artists. Uh, one of my favorite being Macuesa here. If you get a chance to, to look him up, I'll, 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 uh, I'll, I'll hook you up. But he, uh, all of this stuff you see here, the, the paints, the wood, the feathers, everything is collected right in the bear's ears, right? Uh, that is uh, very, very, very special. Uh, so, you know, to be able to show just how important this is to contemporary uh, groups, I think, is very, very important. And so we wanted to be able to do this without reproducing these kind of colonial tropes of the museum, which, you know, is, has a, I probably don't need to tell you, has a, a, a rather complex history. Uh, so how do we balance these, these, these concerns? Uh, and we went with this uh, more naturalistic, very open air environment uh, that actually situates uh, this space within the canyon itself. Uh, and I think that kind of solves some of those challenges, at least to a degree. I'm not saying it's unproblematic. Uh, there's still a lot to think through there. Uh, but nevertheless, it's a, just sort of playing on that concept a little bit. Uh, and then uh, similarly, the credit space, right? One of the things we, uh, I think, realized fairly uh, early on is that the credit scroll uh, is wholly inappropriate for something like this, right? We didn't want to... Uh, create a hierarchical, uh, you know, relationship between all the participants with, say, mine or Ben's name at the very, very top, and then the people who hold these places sacred, uh, at, you know, in the middle somewhere underneath our funding partners and all that. That would be uh, incredibly problematic. So we once again kind of went with a more circular design in which we could uh, place uh, our, our kind of credits, uh, which are, you know, myriad, right? Uh, kind of all on equal, equal footing, right? So they could all be sort of seen by uh, moving your body around as opposed to sort of saying, you know, reproducing that first name, best name kind of situation, right? Uh, so we didn't want uh, to reproduce those hierarchies. And I think we found a, a reasonably good solution to that. Uh, and then delivering the content is something I think we're still working through here. Uh, in many ways, uh, we again want to minimize the disruption to the visual environment and not, uh, you know, place things in this landscape that that don't belong there visually, right? Uh, so the vast majority of our content will be audio content, but that r r creates all kinds of problems, right? When you're dealing with nonlinear VR, what happens if, uh, you know, a, a user flies through uh, and triggers all of the audio content all at once, right? So uh, we had to think of a content management system, which is, I think is still very much under development, uh, that would you know, be kind of aware of where the user is in space, uh, but also kind of queue up content if they have triggered multiple relevant things based on where they're positioned uh, in the environment here. Uh, and so far, I, I'm still struggling with how do we guide, where, how do we place affordances in this uh, you know, landscape uh, or in this reproduction of the landscape. Uh, do we use audio alone, which I think is a, one possible solution? Do we have soft, subtle glows? 
Uh, what do we do uh, to ensure that the user gets to the key content areas that are uh, all about delivering our core message, right? The Visit with Respect campaign, I think, first and foremost. Uh, but ultimately, uh, much of the work, much of the innovation, much of the, uh, uh, of the things that we have yet to, uh, to do uh, are happening here. And that's in community uh, consultation uh, and building those partnerships. We've had uh, quite a lot of luck, I don't want, or, or quite a lot of success, really, uh, in many ways. I don't want to name names, uh, but uh, we are uh, in conversation with, with many of these groups at this, at this point. Uh, and I, I think you know, what I'm really hoping to do is ensure that these conversations between our kind of core development team, our, our funding partners, these kinds of things, and these communities happen at the deepest possible level. Uh, and have the most, uh, you know, the greatest kind of transmission back and forth, right? The kind of the clearest sort of conversation that we can have. And that includes uh, integrating, uh, uh, you know, native voices at the design level, uh, maintaining this kind of government to government consultation, uh, which is super important, but also uh, being as deeply collaborative as we can. Uh, and then uh, finally, these last two categories, implementation and support, I think are easily forgotten. Uh, like implementation itself, uh, you know, where is this uh, going to be? Uh, what version, uh, what content uh, library will be appropriate in what space, for instance, is a, is a potential question. And then support, how do we maintain this, uh, not only for our uh, you know, funding partners who will likely be the ones installing this in their visitor centers and stuff, but also maintain a library of content uh, that can have material removed should a tribal partner decide that it's no longer appropriate to have that. So there's a, a sort of an entire infrastructure here that sort of once the project's done, I, I can't sort of do, do one of those and, and pat myself on the back, right? It's, uh, there has to be sort of an ongoing relationship both with this product and the communities who have helped uh, build that out. Uh, and so that I'll leave the rest of the time here for comments, questions, et cetera. I just wanna acknowledge all of these people. It's an incredible uh, list of uh, collaborators, uh, uh, and contributors to this, so I'm extremely grateful to be working with uh, what I consider the best of. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Okay, before we open it up, Mark is going to offer us some some Mark like comment. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, some brief thoughts. I, I want to sort of think think with you about this project for just a moment um, as a sort of preface, I'm seeing a lot of this for the first time, so I, I don't have a lot of you know, very substantive comments other than uh, I have some very uh, strong suggestions about how to do those interior spaces, because I've spent you know, six or seven years doing photographic related kinds of underground spaces. So I have some thoughts on that, and we can talk offline. I wanted to think a, a little bit with you, um, maybe just to start off this conversation, about um, the how ethically fraught this project is. This is maybe the most ethically fraught VR photogrammetry digital project I've ever seen. Um, because you know, on the one hand you have local buy-in, but on the one hand you have you know two university professors who are coming in and building that local buy-in. Right? On, on the one hand, you want to keep, you know introduce people to this space, and rightfully so. But on the other hand, you also want to keep out of this space by giving them an opportunity to experience it without actually having to go there and to interact with a fragile environment. And as you noted, there's this yet third level, which is, it's a sacred environment. And it's a sacred environment that I would uh, imagine uh, not a few of your community members would rather that people don't know anything about in the first place. Um, and so I, I wanted to, to just, uh, I have a couple other thoughts, but invite you to, to tell us a little bit more about how you're thinking through just the very basic ethical conundrum that this project presents, and also this yet further basic question of why do this? Right? Um, what is your ideal end goal? Because it seems like you're setting yourself up for what's going to be a fight no matter what. And I can imagine that, mo that a lot of people, including some people in this room, including myself, would, in your position, say, I'm going to go back to my own stuff. 
<laughs> right? <laughs> and, and, and reasonably so. And yet you have, you've, you've chosen to do this. You've put a huge amount of time, you've put a huge amount of resources, uh, institutional and personal, into this. And, um, and that, that question, at least for me, still lingers, which is, you know, what is the ideal state for this sort of project, <laughs> given that it is uh, ethically fraught on, on every single level, from every corner? Um, so I, I guess I'll, I'll start with that, and then if you can give like a three sentence answer to that question. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God! Yeah, there's no three sentence answer. I'm sorry. I, I think it's uh, you're absolutely right. This is a, an ethically fraught project, uh, really, from its very get go, and that's it's one of the reasons why I pay attention, even in talks like this, to the the backstory here, because a lot of the time, the the first question we'll get in these conversations with tribal governments and potential partners uh, is, why are we just hearing about this now? Right? Uh, why weren't we part of this uh, before you started taking those photographs? And I said, well, that's, we wish you were, uh, you know, but here's the kind of timeline. This is, here's how this unfolded. Uh, and, and so that's, that's a, a big part of it. The other thing uh, I'll say, too, is that you know, there's always, always a mixed response in every single meeting. Uh, these tribal governments, they, they, these communities, they do not speak with one voice, nor would, should we expect them to. Uh, so I'll have uh, at the very same uh, table, very same conversation, have one person say, this isn't fabulous. Uh, you know, climate change is threatening uh, this landscape and we need, to, we need to preserve it. And this project does exactly that. And then the very next comment is, what are we doing here? This is, uh, you know, these, these sites are meant to have a life. They're meant to uh, decay and crumble. And is it uh, okay? to encode them forever in some space that we don't control, right? So, you know, there's uh, always quite a lot to work with. I think ultimately uh, my goal here is not to kind of be a master of some giant mega narrative, but to rather create a platform for exactly those kinds of conversations. So. Uh, you know, if, if uh, you know, but, and essentially to do that, I, I, I really are, am inviting our community partners to say whatever they want uh, and, and put in here. So I think usually that's cultural information, but if they want to, you know, say uh, this is a problem, like what you are doing right now is a problem, and here's why, uh, I welcome that. Um, and I don't think that solves the problem, right? Uh, not at all. Uh, but but I, I hope it, it at least opens those spaces for further conversations. And, and I will just add, sorry, I'm way over three sentences, but I, I will just add uh, also that this work is happening with or without me uh, and with or without this kind of level of attention to the needs and concerns of these partner communities. Right now, I don't have to tell you, you could go out there right now, it's perfectly legal to take a full scan of everything that I've shown you here today uh, and put it up on Sketchfab, which happens all the time, uh, and, and say whatever you want about it, publish it in any way you want. There's no, it's the Wild West, right? So, you know, uh, of photogrammetry out there now, and it's happening. Uh, so, you know, I think the, the kind of cat's out of the bag ethically in some way, and I, and I hope that what we're doing at least allows uh, a, a means to comment on that. And it, and it, it's happening outside of VR too. Right? Oh, yeah. Like, Recur to, like, our, working with community partners to, like, archive their material. Like, it's, just, it's the same conundrum, but just a different. Yeah, and I, just, I think I think your I mean your your answer to everything you presented is um, is wonderfully nuanced and it's also uh, maybe um, appropriately um, I don't know uh, knowledgeable about the fact that you're not going to be able to change a lot of these things and that this project is going forward and that other projects like it are going forward and it's better to be asking the question than not to be asking the question. I think you're absolutely right. What I want to do is to sort of push you to do a little bit for us now is to look forward to phase two, right? You sort of previewed phase two, you talked about uh, community engagement, about uh, turning this data over to local communities, uh, about using this in education within communities. Um, what does that look like to you? What's your, what's your ideal, what would it take to get there? Um, and again, sort of what, what challenges do you expect to see? I mean, I think uh, there's sort of a, mon Monetary challenges, I think, first and foremost, right? This is going to take a lot of money to do right, yes. uh, because again, you have to not just buy it all the stuff once. You know, you have to really think of a of a multi-year 
potentially, you know, decade plus long plan of how to continually update, support, uh, and train uh, this, uh, you know, train uh, folks to, to, to do this kind of work. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't really have a great answer now. I think we're still uh, very much in the kind of brainstorming phase and uh, trying to seek out uh, institutional partners uh, that, that would be in it for the long haul in that way, supporting not only the initial, you know, teaching and training aspects, uh, but, uh, but also the, the technology support going forward. The technology is relatively accessible now, but still we're, we're talking a, a lot of money. Uh, and then there's, of course, the support end, uh, which I don't have the slides here, but I mean, I think one of the things we're thinking about is how to, uh, you know, provide a, a service in which these content libraries can be stored in a way that uh, folks like me can't access that the information that's being stored on those servers, right? Uh, or how do we create a platform where that information can then be translated into a VR experience without the developers being able to hear it because this is private information, right? It's, it's information that's not meant for me uh, and, and therefore needs to be handled in a very kind of creative way. I've talked to a, a, a number of folks at conferences and such, uh, you know, corporations that kind of deal with this data management issue and uh, they, a lot of them are working through this problem uh, but are not yet ready to handle these massive data sets. So I'm kind of hoping, you know, Phase one is still a, a number of years away from, from completion and publication, so I'm kind of hoping that uh, they catch up along with, with us, right? Yeah. Um, so I, I, I mean, as I sort of mentioned, I think this project presents this uh, core issue that all of us are dealing with in the new chain. Maybe that this is actually a sort of a prime example, so I want to get to conversation, but you are a landscape archaeologist, and I wanted to ask you a landscape archaeologist question. Uh -huh. um, uh, because it, it seems to me that you know, this is a landscape project, and the one thing that didn't actually uh, appear is one, one of the core questions that landscape archaeologists ask, which is about seasonality um, and about different um, uh, modes of interaction with landscapes in different seasons and different time periods. And, and I want you to sort of think a little bit about what this project could look like if you were to bring in those landscape perspectives, because as is, this is a, a rather static project, and I know that you are trained to and attuned to. Um, Sort of uh, issues that at least this this version doesn't doesn't tackle. Yeah, it's a it's a great question. I, I mean, I would say that like uh, at least in the work done so far, I've kind of almost taken the opposite approach of like integrating seasonality. I, I very deliberately uh, capture a moment in time. I, I'm not one of those photogrammetrists who sort of sits around and waits for cloud cover. I want the sunbeams. I, I want the, the the sense of of light hitting the landscape in that moment. And I think, you know, on some level that, that creates a, a beautiful uh, product uh, that, that feels very naturalistic. It, it feels less, maybe a little less gamified, um, but at the same time goes in the other direction of, of the kinds of things that we might want to include, the kinds of narratives we might want to include that involve movement, seasonality, the passage of time, the way time is integrated into the landscape by uh, the descendant communities to this day, right? So. Um, yeah, it's a fair, <laughs> it's a fair question for sure. There are existing visitor centers that reference the seasons. Yeah. Um, what is the How are they handling all of these kind of technical issues? What's what's their tone in presenting the material about this site? It's a great, great question. I, I think um, I don't know if I'm really that well positioned to comment on the specifics, but. It, it does remind me of uh, something that I, I haven't mentioned, maybe explicitly, which is a rather adversarial relationship between partner communities and our core funding agency, which is the Bureau of Land Management, right? Uh, and so I think my sense of it is that they are not really engaging with it in a way that the communities are super happy with. Uh, and I think that, you know, uh, Turn off the camera for a second, but I think one of the the, the, the things that the, the sort of the the, uh, the the real reason why we're getting this fairly large amount of funding isn't because they want a, a, a VR experience in the visitor center. It's because they want someone to be building bridges that have been damaged, particularly during the Trump administration. But uh, again, through you know hundreds of years now of, of colonization. Uh, often spearheaded by, uh, you know, these these Department of the Interior organizations like the BLM, 
Uh, and so I, I think, uh, you know, it's, it's a complex question. Thanks, uh, Eric. This is a really fantastic uh, presentation. I wanted to ask on the slide, the other slide I think was about uh, raising the right kind of awareness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and one of the items, a uh, bullet point was uh, under that heading was maximizing emotional connection mm -hmm. through virtual reality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I really think points to something like a, a, a big part of not only virtual reality, but immersive technologies and immersive media that. Uh, you know, uh, it seems to me to be really, really central to the concerns of this conference, and that is uh, the uh, effective and emotional dimension of immersive technologies. And part of the reason these things are desirable is because they foster emotional connection uh, in all sorts of ways. Uh, so. Uh, you know, that's definitely something that I think a lot about, uh, too. Of course, for me, I kind of do the opposite. I want people to go uh, to the theater rather than to the <laughs> I just uh, was hoping to you know, think alongside of you a little bit in terms of how you're thinking about uh, emotion in virtual reality specifically and, you know, what sort of techniques or, you know, how you're, you know, what you plan to do or what you've done and what's worked and what hasn't, and why that's important. Yeah, it's, it's an excellent question. I think you appreciate it. I think, uh, um, you know, the, the way I, I kind of uh, in, envision folks' interaction with this piece of VR is uh, as essentially as someone, you know, with a body in a landscape. Now, you can't see your body, but you have some of the senses, hearing, vision, these kinds of things. Uh, and also, it's nonlinear, right? And I think not only are you kind of placing people in a at least somewhat embodied way into a piece of media, you're also doing it in a way in which not every user experience is going to be the same. Uh, and I think that really matters. I think you, know, you can get a lot of information from what's existing in the visitor centers now, largely, which is uh, you know, a video that you watch. And it's a little visit with respect messaging that uh, it tells you a little bit about what to watch out for out there and so forth. And it's sort of point A to point B to point C. I think a lot of people are probably you know, watching it to, to fill permit requirements and then not doing, not really engaging it with it beyond that. What I'm hoping is that by bringing people into these virtual spaces, uh, that they will feel that kind of embodied connection. And then when they take the headset off, they'll turn to their neighbor and say, oh, did you see this? Uh, you know, did you hear that piece of content, right? And the neighbor will hopefully say, or you sometimes say, no, I didn't, right? What did you, you know, what, what happened there? And I think that's just a, a, a way to uh, encourage these kinds of conversations that really will, people will remember and potentially internalize in a way that's, that's different from sort of presenting that kind of linear, two-dimensional, sort of disconnected from one's body content, if that makes sense. Yeah, so we still have a lot of that work to go. Right now, we have a, a fairly limited library of that kind of content. But what we are doing, just as a kind of methodology piece, is uh, we are video recording that that content and then uh, extracting the audio. Yeah, so that the user will experience the audio only, but for uh, you know potential future use or for archival purposes, you know this, these narratives are recorded in, in videos. And are you Yeah, 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 absolutely. As you know, I'm doing a similar project with the Fowler with objects, but it's, right, right. it's the same kind of thing where people, you can't direct always an interview to go a certain way. Mm -hmm. You can put in other so how do you think of content pieces that might live in yeah, that's, it's a really great question. So our kind of gold standard is to take our, our partners, which are you know specialists, right? These are folks who are chosen by tribal councils and stuff, who do 
be authorized to speak about these kinds of things. So they, they you know, they're, they're well studied in, uh, in what to say, but our, our, our ultimate goal is to bring them on site when possible uh, and have them kind of talk there uh, as much as possible, both for, you know, just because it's, I think it's very inspiring to be at these places and, and also I think just dimensions of the audio itself are different. Uh, and I think that's important too. But a lot of the folks uh, who are you know, uh, experts, cultural experts, are not able to reach these places, right? So in that case, uh, currently we're partnering with the Crow Canyon Archaeological Center to use their spaces as like a, a kind of an audio recording booth, right? Or, or, or studio, it's a better word, yeah. Uh, so, um, you know, it's, it, it's a mix. So, you know, ideally, yes, on site, but um, I can tell you it's always a little sketchy even for me to get down to the moon house. It's, it's tricky. Um, so, so yeah, it's not always an option. Yeah. Maybe just one more question at the time, I think. Right. I'll, I'll get a chance to ask Eric's later. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, I have actually, uh, thank you so much for your presentation. A very basic question about embodied interaction. Sure, yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's a really, really great question. Um, very astute, and I, I think you know you're, you're you're comparing the lived experience of going to a place like this, which you know for me it's a whole day. For most visitors, it's at least half a day, uh, and that adds so much to it. Meanwhile, our sort of target, what we expect our users to to actually be in this experience for, is like three to five minutes. Uh, so no, it's not going to be comparable. And, and I think on some level it's not really, I don't think we're trying to replace the experience of going there. Uh, we're trying to give people a taste of what it's like uh, while telling them how to go there, if that makes sense. And maybe why to go there in, in a way that will shape that longer, truly physically embodied visitation. I have a very superficial inspiration. I was thinking this probably Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that would. I think that that would be awesome. It's probably a very different project uh, that some of the assets might translate nicely to. If you want to take a uh, take a run down Fish Creek Canyon, you know, I could I could set that up for you. Uh, but yeah, I think a, a very different style of, of project with very you know very different aims. I mean, I think no offense. It, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. Get nice and tired and dehydrated for maximum impact. Yeah, and, and so again, you know, not to call out anyone who is really leaning into uh, a gaming uh, as, a, as a genre by which uh, cultural heritage information can be communicated. I think that's laudable. Uh, in our case, we're really doing the, trying to do the exact opposite. We're trying to pull away from as many gaming conventions as we can. And yeah, I think it's probably, a, you know, it's a, that, that's going to shorten the amount of engagement we get. There's a lot of cost there, I guess is what I'm saying. It's not going to encourage, you know, people to, to do the next thing. Uh, but I, I think we're, we're just designing around that as best that we can. Yeah. Thank you so much.